in the federal courts. Right now we're going to be returning to Philadelphia and again uh, we've had cameras in two courtrooms there this morning. The, it is the uh, U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. It's in Philadelphia, the courthouse on Market Street. This morning the jury selection was underway for a trial that's called Becker versus Unisys and that trial has just begun and uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. It is an age discrimination case and uh, the Unisys uh, here uh, offered a voluntary retirement incentive program for those taking early retirement. There is a defendant, uh, Edmo Ed uh, Ed Edmona Becker, who found out she had cancer and needed surgery. She was 60 years old. Uh, and this is her case taking Unisys to court, and we're going to listen in as it progresses. And have led to continuing layoffs such that, had she not, and this is really quite an important part of, uh, of the damage case, had she not been laid off, uh, in, or had she not retired in February 1989, uh, she would have been laid off later in 89, or in 1990, or in 1991, as a successive losses demanded and a successive wages. Of okay, well, okay. So w w no. what you're saying is that uh, as this program continued, uh, for whatever these reasons are, primarily financial, right, there came a time when a number of persons would be laid off or otherwise our relationship would be changed through this early return, whatever. Okay, there's no problem with that concept. There were sound business reasons for that number of persons at whatever times it was. Mr. Consul's not quarreling with that. His quarrel is that his client was included in the group. So again, I won't permit the financial witness to testify as the reason for these, these successive labels. I just won't allow it, unless you can show me a different offer of proof. So at the moment, I'll sustain Mr. Consul's objection on the ground he is not disagreeing with the ultimate corporate decision that substantial personal personnel changes had to be made. His quarrel is that his client was included. Well, Your Honor, uh, just... Objection sustained. Thank you. Thank bring, you. In the, bring in the jury. Your Honor, this, this is uh, Mr. Ellis, I've ruled, I've ruled at least four times. I'll I make rule. sure that I understand what my limitations are. For example, can I argue to the jury from that chart? What do you want to argue from the chart? I want to show the chart to the jury, explain to the jury that the company was sustaining severe losses and that's okay. what caused the, the necessity for reduction. For the fourth time, you can't do that. Can I show the chart to the jury? Why? So that the jury will understand something more than okay. Mr. Consul's. Will they help them understand what? The, the, the economic, the severity of the economic losses that the company was sustaining. Okay. For the fifth time, the answer is no. Sit down. Bring in the jury. It's not an issue, Mr. Ellis. It's not an issue. It's an issue. It, to get that evidence mm -hmm. before the jury. Be, it's stipulated. And you can tell the jury that counsel has stipulated. It's a very customary procedure, and you've done it many times at the trial work. Swear the jury, please. Members of the jury, please rise. Please raise your right hand. You do swear that you will voluntarily try the issue joined in the civil action number 9.431, wherein Edmonda H. Becker is the plaintiff and Unisys Corporation is the defendant, and that you will a true verdict render according to the evidence unless sooner discharged by the court or the cause be withdrawn by the party. So help you God. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, members of the jury, uh, you've been selected uh, by the uh, attorneys in this matter uh, to hear this case. Uh, we appreciate your willingness to come here to serve as jurors. We realize that serving as a juror takes you away from maybe where you'd rather be, at work or at home or somewhere else. You come to a place and <clears throat> you find yourself in a strange circumstance and maybe seeing people you, you don't know and maybe hearing a number of terms and phrases and other instructions and the like from the court personnel that are all new to you. So we do realize it can be <clears throat> a first juror experience or maybe even a second or a third one can be sometimes a difficult task and it's a, it's a civic obligation. We appreciate your willingness to come here and serve. You're here to decide the, this case. You've heard a little bit about the case of Edmond H. Becker versus Unisys Corporation in the jury selection. You've heard a little bit about it, not much. Um, the manner in which uh, the case will proceed will be that the attorneys for the parties have a chance to make what we call an opening statement to you. 
Now, the opening statement, member of the jury, is not the attorney's <coughs> principal argument or final argument in the case. And that is because there's, there's been no evidence received. There's nothing to argue about yet. But the attorneys are permitted to make an opening statement in order to summarize for you briefly what they expect the evidence to be in the case. It's like a preview of what the case will be about. When the opening statements are completed, the plaintiff, uh, in this case, uh, Edmonda H. Becker, the lady s sitting at this council table, will have an opportunity through her lawyer, Mr. Consul, to offer evidence in support of the claim. Jurors decide cases based on the evidence in the case. Evidence is kind of a special word. In order for information to become evidence, it has to satisfy certain standards and certain rules. And the attorneys here are experienced, and they know what those rules are, and they've been preparing this case for some time now. And <clears throat> they are prepared to, uh, to offer before you and to speak to you through their questions to the witnesses uh, and uh, their opening statements, uh, their understanding of this case. And keep in mind, member of the jury, what the attorneys say in their opening statement or what I say is not evidence in the case. The evidence will come from this witness stand. The persons who testify from the witness stand offer evidence, and you'll decide the case based on the evidence. Evidence also can be in the form of documents or papers, or possibly charts or pic uh, pictures or photographs. If the court allows you to consider it, then that is evidence, and you're permitted to consider that as jurors in the case. If the court uh, tells you to disregard something that's said or to not consider a particular exhibit or the like, then you cannot consider that. You have to, in a sense, put that aside and not use that as a basis to decide this case. You can only decide the case based on the evidence, and that is the information you're permitted to hear here in this courtroom. Now, when you leave here uh, to go to your homes or even during lunch hour and the like, it's likely you'll see persons in and about the courthouse associated with the case. You'll see the attorneys. You may see some of the parties. They're instructed not to discuss anything with you. So if they don't speak to you, they're not being unkind or discourteous. They're following the court instructions that they not communicate with jurors. I'd also ask you to be very careful when you leave here not to discuss this case with anyone. I'm sure persons at home and other places where you have acquaintances will be interested in your jury service. And they may ask you about the case. And I'd urge you not to discuss the case so long as you're serving on the jury. And the reason for that is many persons that you'll talk to in an, in an effort to be helpful um, may expect uh, uh, you to tell them about their jury experience or maybe about something they heard about this person or that location. And the difficulty with discussing it, that brings into your knowledge information that is not evidence in this case. So it's better not to discuss the case or any part of it until your jury service is finished on this case. When your jury service is finished, that is when you've rendered your verdict and your until your jury service is finished on this case. When your jury service is finished, that is when you've rendered your verdict and you're discharged, then you can discuss this case with anyone. There's no restriction of any kind about discussing this case or any topic that comes up in this case with anyone. But while you're serving, uh, by taking the oath, you agree that you will just commit your service to this case and the evidence you hear in this courtroom. The way uh, every case uh, begins, members of the jury, as I mentioned a moment before, is for the attorney to make an opening statement. The way the case will close is when the attorneys make a closing argument. And finally, I will give you the instructions. I'll uh, state to you at the end of the case the principles of law that are involved in this case. Uh, you might prefer that I tell you that now. Well, I, I can't tell you what all of them are now because I haven't heard the case either. We're going to listen to the case together. You will consider the evidence because you will be the judges of what we call the facts in the case. You will decide and only you will decide what was said and what happened and where did this take place or did that take place at all or whatever. That's your role. And neither the attorneys nor the court can take that away from you. The court's role is to decide what the principles of law are that apply. I don't know what the principles of law are that will apply until I've heard all the evidence. I know what some of them are, and I'm telling you some of those now, some of these legal principles. 
But when the case is finished, the attorney will assist me by giving me references in the various statutes and cases that they think I should tell you about. And after we've had our conference in that regard, I will give you those instructions. And then you'll go to the jury room, just the eight of you, and decide the case. And that's how every case works. <coughs> so this is no different. But it's very important to both sides that you listen to the evidence, do not discuss the case, do not make up your mind, and you've heard all the evidence. There's sometimes somebody begins to tell you something that they know or they've heard, and you kind of make your, start to make your mind up about it. I'd ask you in this circumstance as a juror that you not do that. Where do you hurt all the evidence until you decide anything in the case? And only then, when you're in the jury room together following the court's instructions. In every case, a party has the burden of proof. And in a civil case such as this, the plaintiff has the burden of proof. That is, the plaintiff has the burden of persuading you that she's correct. And the manner in which the plaintiff satisfies that burden of proof is by offering what we call evidence, which is information received by the court in the form of testimony or exhibits, or in some cases, attorneys are permitted to read excerpts from documents and the like to the jury. If the court allows him to do that, I will tell you that's evidence. Sometimes the attorneys will agree to certain things. That attorneys call that a stipulation. That's a fancy word for, for agreement. If they agree on something or the court allows you to hear it, then it's evidence and you can consider it in the case. The plaintiff offers evidence to witnesses and documents and exhibits and the like, and that's what the plaintiff will do through her counsel in this case. We're going to have a number of exhibits in this case. Exhibits are simply documents and papers, maybe letters or memoranda. This is a case involving a, this lady's employment with a defendant company. And we're going to have some memoranda and some other things that were generated as she worked there between the various departments. And there might be some other exhibits as well. We'll not give you those exhibits during the trial to read thoroughly. You couldn't take all that time to read it all. And there'll be a number of exhibits here. The attorneys on occasion, however, may call your attention to a particular excerpt or a particular paragraph where they may read something from an exhibit. Keep in mind, you have the exhibits in the jury room to read for as long as you want and to take as much time to deliberate upon them as you want. So if these exhibits seem to be moving rather promptly through the witnesses and the like, keep in mind, you'll see them all in the jury room. The attorneys will make sure that uh, your attention is brought to those portions of the exhibits that the attorney for either side thinks you should pay attention to with more care than possibly other portions. So with that, uh, let's commence this case by my calling upon the attorney for the plaintiff, Mr. Consul, to make his opening statement to you. Mr. Consul. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good afternoon. As you know, my name is Stephen Consul, and I have the privilege representing Mr. Becker in this case against municipal corporation. This is a case about age discrimination and cancer discrimination. You will hear testimony in this case about the fact that Mrs. Becker, at age 60, less than one month after being diagnosed as having cancer, was told by Unisys and a company she had worked for for 19 years that she was either going to be laid off in three weeks or she would have to take retirement. This was being said to her at a time when younger employees actually were going to take over her job duties. Who is Mrs. Becker? Mrs. Becker was born in 1929. At the time of the termination, she was 60 years of age. After raising seven children at the age of 40, Mrs. Becker went back into the workforce. And she started at the very bottom. She took a clerical position which paid $80 a week at Sperry Corporation. Now, Sperry Corporation is the predecessor to Unisys. It turned into Unisys down the road. Mrs. Becker then began to work her way up through Unisys, through Sperry Corporation. In fact, within six years, she obtained the highest award the company gives, the Presidential Award, given to 15 out of approximately 100,000 employees, nominated by your coworkers, not by management. Mrs. Becker received that award. She then went on to get management. You're looking at a live picture from Philadelphia in the district court courtroom there, and uh, this particular case 
just starting to get underway and you already can see one of the small problems it can be for the viewer a large problem <clears throat> that we're getting into early and that is that it's difficult to hear counsel because uh, they're using that mic sitting there right on the desk to pick it up and that's something that uh, 